What winning at golf teaches us about winning in business. This is Golf Smarter, number 840. This is Golf Smarter. Welcome to the Golf Smarter podcast, Kevin. Nice to see you, Fred. It's, it's great to have you on the show. I really appreciate you reaching out. You found me on LinkedIn, which is not the usual source of uh, content that I, that I find, but you've just written a book that kind of ties it all together for us. I'm very excited to talk to you about the book, The Great Game. Um, Thank you. What gave you this idea of, of putting the development of business with the development of your golf skills together and find a correlation that works for both? I think it, um, it sort of came as a result of a couple of things. One, I got into golf uh, about uh, 10, 10, 11 years ago. I'd played as a kid, but uh, not really, I think, seriously. And through work, um, I was being asked to come to other business, sort of business and golf groups and i decided to you know play a bit more and then in my coaching with clients it was very much i use analogies a lot so you know if this business was a restaurant what would we do and a lot of my clients were into sports so it would be if we were a football team what would we do and then i had a number of clients who were golfers and we were talking about sort of, sort of golfing situations and as i sort of was doing more of that and then actually getting coaching in golf myself I'm talking to my golf coach about certain things and thinking well actually that's relevant in business as well so these crossovers are always there and there was a a great um, um, coach called uh, Tim Galway you must have come across uh, Tim and the inner inner game of golf so um, I'd, I'd read all of his books I've actually managed to get coached by him because I'm into tennis as well Um, and so he had a book called the inner game of work and the inner game of golf and tennis and all of those things sat around my head for a number of uh, number of years and I made a few notes and then when the lockdown happened and I had a little bit of uh, free time because there's nothing to do you couldn't play golf (laughs) Uh, I just suddenly thought, you know, maybe it's time to write another book. I'd written two before this one. And this sort of idea just came out and I wrote some chapter headings down. I thought, I wonder if I can relay this, you know, these sort of uh, ideas from business into golf and golf into business. And the book just came out of that. It's so interesting because uh, the chapters of your book, as you say, they correlate to both um, from the game, the goal, the players, the course, the hazards, conditions, clubs, the rules, they all relate to both golf and business. And, you know, yep. so frequently I'll, I'll get, um, since I've been doing the podcast, I'll have people write to me saying, hey, I've come up with this great idea for a business in golf, and I, I just love golf, and I want to get into And it's like, hey, can you help me out? And it's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not the person to give you <laughs> advice on doing that. But you know, what I always want to know when I'm at, talking to somebody about the business they're doing is, do you have support at home to start your business? Because if you hear fingers tapping on the table or the foot tapping on the floor while you're trying to develop your idea, it's going to be a struggle to, to get where you have to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the, the sad fact really is that, you know, it's very difficult to know how many startups turn into actual businesses. But we mm-hmm. know from the statistics of those businesses that have actually started, um, probably 50% will fail within the first year. Right. So of all of those ideas that people have, and you know, what I've found in business is, is ideas are, are the easy bit. It's the implementation of those ideas and turn them into right. a profitable business. That's the difficult right. bit. You know, you've got loads of people, oh, I've got this great idea for a business. And I see people that have been going for two or three years. And we, we have in the UK a program called Dragon's Den. I don't know if you've got a similar thing in, in the States where people Don't come know. and pitch their business to some uh, okay. angel investors and then they choose I to... think on TV it's called Shark Tank. Yeah. Shark Tank, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, and um, you see those sort of businesses and the, you know, even those, you think, well, they're not going to invest in them, so how the hell are they actually going to work? 
And that was really one of the reasons I got into into business coaching is, you know, both my parents had businesses uh, when I was 12. My dad gave up a really good job uh, to start up a sign company. My mum started a printing business from her front room. So I was 12 year old and I was sort of setting uh, tight fonts into a printer. We were printing business cards <laughs> and selling them to my friends Ooh. at school. Um, so that and, one's and, it's, gone. and it is great fun when you start a business. It's like starting golf. You know, when you first pick up a golf club and you hit a ball and you think, wow, that's that's great. You sort of get addicted to it. Um, but then if you don't get lessons, if you don't get an understanding of how a business works, as a business isn't about what you're selling. It's not the service or the product. The business is what sits around it and allows you to grow it and make it profitable. So, so, the, so again, those analogies work really well. Is you can pick up a golf club, you can go on a golf course, you can hit balls, you can play, but after two or three years, you look at your swing and go, yeah, that's probably not the best swing ever. Or you can go and get some <laughs> lessons and you can go and learn how to do it properly and then you, you're still not guaranteed to be a great golfer, but you're certainly going to have a better chance of success you know, as, as you practice more and you go more. The same is true in business. You know, the majority of business people start businesses with no idea. They've never run a business before. As you said, they've got a partner sitting at home going, you know, you've got to put food on the table. You know, you know you're spending all your time at work. You're not spending time with a family. And, and those pressures, along with the pressures of growing a business, often cause that business to fail, even though it's, a, it's inherently a good business and could go on further. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a business or a product and said, great idea, bad execution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's like the, uh, the practice swing on, a, uh, uh, on, the, on the first tee. The practice swing looks great. Then you hit the ball oh, and yeah. it doesn't go where you want it to go. <laughs> but, uh, in your exactly. minds, it's there, but the execution is not always uh, as, as it should be. Yeah. Right, and you always you always can tell what's going to happen with your business when you tell a friend or a colleague or somebody you've met about your idea for your business. Like, wow, that's really a great idea for a business. And then, you, you know, you say, um, would you like to invest in it? And they're like, well, it's not. Yeah. That <laughs> that's always a good test. Lit, lit, litmus tape paper to... Uh, but that, that's like saying, you know, well, I, I think I'll take up golf as a, a living. Will you back me? And it's like, well, yeah, maybe not with that swing. I won't. Uh... Yeah, exactly. Um, so I just lost a headphone here, so I had to make some changes. So I hope you can still hear me. Um, yep. yep. So often, um, you know, like I said, people will come up with ideas and you just, you just don't know. You know, you never know. And then they invest all their time and money. Um, mm. How, you know, how did you, you know, you started golf and business as a child, but you left golf for a long time. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you brought it and then you came back to it and you saw the analogies between the two um, and decided that, you know, this, this is a great idea for a book. Huh? Tell me more about the development of the book. So I think the within within the uh the business world um but I think it was my my analogy with business has always been business is just a game. Okay that's that's what business is. We we come in whether you've got a great idea or whether you buy a business off somebody else or you buy a franchise or start it from scratch if you're a you know, if you're an employee, let's say you're the CEO of a boss of a, of a business uh, or an employee of a business, you know, it, if, you, if you come at a business as being a game, then I think you come at it in a different mindset as if you are, you know, it's a job, you know, it's there to pay the bills. If you come to work just to pay the bills every day, whatever job you're doing is not going to be that exciting. Okay, and that that to me was like another one of the chapters was if you come and play golf to pay the bills, then it's not that exciting a game. And and I think you find this with uh, the lower level tour players who want to make it big, you know. And I've I've spoken to a few, I've known a few, and uh, 
And it's hard work. You know, they are going from tournament to tournament to tournament, scrabbling around to pay the next airfare, to sleep in a hotel, to sleep in a van, their car. You know, you see them on Sky and they're carrying their bags. You know, it's it's far from what we see on, uh, you know, on the, on the major tournaments. And that's the hard work. That's the bit that we don't see when we see the, the top guys. Um, and the same is true within business is you see the successful people that have got the big businesses and all the wealth and, and um, bits and pieces that go with that. What you don't see is the hard work and all the challenges that they've been through in order to get to where they want to be. Um, and it's very difficult to actually treat your know, business as a game when you are dependent on it, when you know your family are dependent on it and it has to work. Once you get to a point where it is working and, and you don't, you know, you're, you're being paid and you can actually just go in into it to enjoy it as a game, then it really does change. And, and this is really the sort of phases of a business that it goes through. So the three phases that the first phase is just time for money. It's hard work. You've got to put the effort in. The second phase is then is building the structure of the business and employing a great team and then getting the team to work for you. And it's not really until the third phase where you then have the choice of, well, I could sell this, I could grow it further, or I can just maintain it that where the, I would say the real fun is at that stage. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think what we're going to do here, we're going to take a quick time out. And when we come back, I, I hope you're comfortable with this, but I'm going to have you, we're going to go chapter by chapter in this book, break it down and, and huh? get your approach to both. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll be back right after this. And we're here with Kevin Stansfield, author of The Great Game, How Lessons from the Great Game of Golf Can Help You Win the Equally Great Game of Business. Um, I've really been enjoying the book, I have to tell you. Uh, I'm like, each night, I got a couple books on the stand, but I'm like, I got to go farther with this one because <laughs> I'm curious to know how in the heck I'm still doing this after being in business for myself for 30 plus years and not knowing what the heck I'm doing. So <laughs> really enjoying the book. And um, even if you're not an entrepreneur, and now mm. I'm communicating to the audience, but if you're not an entrepreneur, but you're in business and you're an employee for somebody else, you're going to find value in this book. And especially if you love golf, but I'm assuming that's why you're listening to this show. Um, you're going to find value in this book, no matter what end of business you're in, uh, because there's tremendous insight. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I, I think I did really want to make sure it was as inclusive as it could be that, uh, you know, predominantly targeted at business owners, because I, I think they're the guys that need a lot of support but the the people that are working in the directors you know the c-level guys that are looking to drive a business forwards everything in here is still relevant it really is about that mindset of where do we take this business and if we want to win that game what do we need to do to actually help us to achieve that so i think it, it works on all counts on that basis but there are things in the book as far as being a golfer that really resonated with me. It had nothing to do with business. <laughs> but I think, you know, it, it's like a line like this. I look at my game now compared to a year ago, and I think I'm so much better. Yet, I look at my scorecard, and they're pretty <laughs> similar to, to you know, my rounds in the past. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Um, you know, you talk about no matter how well you play, you always leave shots in the course. No matter, no matter how badly you play, there's always a good shot in there to bring you back for more. Those things to me were like, yep, got it, check, done. Love and think, that comment. And that, that is why I think golf has stood the test of time, why it is still as popular now that it ever has been, because it, it, it's probably the most inclusive game out there, you know, Men can play against women, boys against men. You know, it really doesn't matter because of the handicap system allows Correct. that interaction that no other game actually has at that level. Really doesn't. Um, and and that and that's and that's why I love it so much. But it's also true with business. Business doesn't care whether you're old, young, 
you know, whether you're male, female, whether, you know, what country you come from, what language you speak, it doesn't care. You know, everyone can play the game as well as anyone else if they put their mind to it and if they learn how to play it as well as they can be and are prepared to give, you know, a lifetime sort of of, of dedication to the game itself. You know, and that's, you see golfers, you know, the, it always amazes me the, you know, the old pros are on the senior tour. You know, these guys don't have to go to work. You know, they, they've got more money than they need to yet they still cho choose to actually go and play. With no other sport, really, can you play still competitively at such a, uh, an old age. Um, and same with business. You know, Warren Buffett's, what, 83 now or something? He's in his 80s, and he's still playing the game. Not because he has to earn any more money. He just plays it because he loves playing the game. So, uh, and that's, right. that's, again, one of the, the big similarities to, to golf as a particular sport Although you know most sports still apply with everything that's in this book as well, so. and there's something unique about professional golfers, especially that I kind of compared to doctors in many ways, and that's the sense that you go to medical school and you learn to be a doctor, and then you go to open a practice and you have no idea what you're <laughs> doing. You can't run a business. Yeah. Well, a professional golfer is, you know, their whole life is playing golf day and day and day in and day out. And yet they, when they become a successful um, golf professional, they're running a business because mm -hmm. it's not like they're employed by somebody who sends them a paycheck, you know, uh, a team sport, whether it, it's soccer, football, basketball, baseball, they work for somebody, they're getting a paycheck. Yeah. And professional golfers only get a paycheck when they succeed. And then they've got to run their business. They have to pay their coaches. They have to pay their caddies. They have to pay for all their expenses. So it, it, at no point do they learn, it's like, I should be going to business school, mm. not, mm. not you school, right? And yeah. doctors, you know, and there's probably many others that we can think of that are the same way. I know many doctors who have been so frustrated in running their business and having nurses and employees and technicians and all these different people on their payroll. And they're like, I don't know how to do hmm. this. This is not what I was trained to do. Uh, there's, there's a fantastic book uh, by a guy called Michael Gerber. Uh, and the book is called The E-Myth. Uh, and the, his latest version was The E-Myth Revisited. And The E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth. And, and that is the fact that Businesses are not run by entrepreneurs. The majority of businesses are run by technicians. So the plumber mm. starts a plumbing business. The accountant starts an accountancy business. Exactly what you're saying there. The golfer starts a golfing business. You know, they're very good at the technical delivery, but they're not business people. They haven't learned mm -hmm. how to build and scale a business. True entrepreneurs are the people like, um, you know, Richard Branson, uh, Alan Sugar in you know, in the UK. You know, I used to say Donald Trump, but I don't. I don't tend to <laughs> say Donald Trump anymore. Uh, but people who understand the game, and it doesn't matter what business they're doing, what they're selling, the game of business is exactly the same. They just choose to be. Yeah, you know, I've got a property business. I've got a service business. I've got a retail business. Those are the ones I would call the true entrepreneurs who have the ability to play multiple games uh, across the board. And I, I sort of put it, it's difficult within golf because that would be like a golfer playing tennis and football and five different sports. And that rarely happens at a very high level. So the analogy I brought in in, in one of the chapters was golf is actually many games in one. You've got the driving game, you've got the long iron game, you've got the mid iron game, you've got the short iron game, you've got the chipping game, you've got the putting game. If you want to be great, you've got to master all of those. So that's like you're know, being in an orchestra and saying, well, I've got to master every single instrument within an orchestra to make really good music. And the same within business. In business, you've got to master finance. You've got to master sales. You've got to master people. You've got to master operations. You know, so so you've got you not just doing the work, not just doing the plumbing or the accounting or the landscaping. 
you know, that's just one of the many bits you've got to master. And if you only master one, so you could be the best putter in the world, but you'd be nowhere on the rankings because you can't hit it off the tee. Right. Right. I, and, I, you know, I, I, I've been in business for myself for a long, long time because I'm a technician. And it's like, I love doing the work. I'm happy to do the work. But at, at business development, I don't do well. I don't do that. And I've never been, you know, I, I've had opportunities for scaling and never figured out how, nor have I partnered. So I'm exposing myself here for what I really am. And I'm just doing <laughs> podcasts, as, you know, because I can technically, I mean, I always said, I, I have a lot of questions and I, I have the right equipment so I can do a podcast yep. and it continues on and on with a goal just to do the next one and yeah. to learn a little bit more. That's always been the goal, just to learn a little bit more. Um, and I've always felt like the, the goal of an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur is somebody who can make money while they're sleeping. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you talk about in the book about person, you know, the, the business can run itself. Correct. You don't have to be there and it's still making money. Yeah. Um, and for me, like when they started putting commercials in the podcast, like, oh my God, I'm a step closer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Um, let's, let's go ahead and take another break. I, I promised that we were going to go over the, <laughs> the chapters of the book, and I promise that we will, and we're going to do that when we, after this time out. Kevin, what is it about entrepreneurs? Are, are they the kind of people that have brilliant ideas and make them happen? Um, or are they, do they have a vision of things that other people can't see? How do you define what a true entrepreneur is? I, I, would, I would define a, a, a true entrepreneur as somebody who sees opportunities and exploits them. You know, and when I say exploit, I, mean, I don't mean that in a negative way, you know, in a positive way. And I think uh, Richard Branson was one of the, the best ones that sort of, I think, nailed this for me, was he said, I don't start businesses. Yeah. I find businesses that are already there and I make them better. So, you know, when Branson got into the record industry, people were always selling records. He just sold records in a better way. When he started the airline business, I start an airline business, I see a niche, so I, I make it better. And, uh, you know, we were talking over the break about, you know, Mr. Trump, you know, whether Mr. Trump's an entrepreneur and no, he doesn't invent anything, doesn't create anything, but he does see opportunities and he tries to exploit them. Not always in the best way, I would, I would agree. And this entrepreneur, exploit is a good word. entrepreneurism <laughs> isn't about morals. Morals are separate. You know, you come with your own morals and you do it your way. So there is a lot of entrepreneurs that have done it in a, a bad way. Uh, but that entrepreneurial mindset is seeing the bigger picture. Going back to your point about the technician, the guy who's good at doing the job, you know, they're very good at creating a business that revolves around them. You know, they're, they're the center of it. They're the, the expert. The doctor is the expert. It's very difficult to turn a doctor into a business because they have the knowledge. So, but entrepreneurs see, see the opportunity and they go, right, how do I turn that into a business? How do I make money out of that and grow that? And how do I find the people to run that business? That's the difference. Entrepreneurs think, how do I get somebody else to do the work so that I get paid? And that's when you get to be asleep and make money, whereas the technician is actually having to go to work at night to make the money. Uh, and it is a different mindset that sometimes the switch gets switched on. Sometimes it's sort of you know, uh, uh, developed at a very early age. You know, so entrepreneurs often come from entrepreneurial type families, but not always. Uh, but something happens in their mindset. And sometimes it's from failure. You know, I failed at this and I'm not doing that again. So that then drives them on to actually having a business that will work without them at some point in the future. But isn't failure critical to success? 100%. In many ways? 100%. Because you don't learn anything. I always felt you don't learn anything from doing things right. It's like, oh, it worked. Okay, I'll just keep doing it. What yeah. am I doing? But it's when you make mistakes and go, okay, I'm not going to do that again. You learn from that. Yeah. 
I, I always think a uh, little analogy I have is if, if life is just a, a, a load of failures that we learn from, successful people and, and entrepreneurs I'll put into that manage to fail a lot quicker than unsuccessful people. So successful people and uh, entrepreneurs will, will get their thousand failures very early on in their life. Mm -hmm. Unsuccessful people will drag their thousand failures over their entire life. Yeah. So, and so you, you see failure as, um, as a lesson. You don't see it yeah. as the end result. You don't see it as like, oh, well, I guess I can't do that. Yeah. And if you take like, it to the I, golfing analogy, that's like standing mm -hmm. on the first tee and going, do you know what? I think this ball might slice off into the tree, so I won't hit it. Whereas the dedicated person says, right, I'm going to hit this 100 times until I get the darn thing straight. Yeah. Or how about the guy who on the third hole is going, oh, it's really going bad. This is going to be a terrible day. You have 15 holes left. Yeah. Don't quit now. Yeah. That was that was the last shot. Okay. It doesn't reflect what the next shot is going to be unless you... It has nothing to do with the next shot. Exactly. 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 We've talked uh, about this. Um, there was a, a gentleman here in the States by the name of John Madden, hmm. um, who you may have heard about because of the video game, but he was a, an announcer of football, but he was also a football coach. And I worked with him for a number of years and, and he kept encouraging me to go into business, to leave radio, to go into business for myself. And he had this phrase that he used in his pep talk for his, his team when he was a coach and even, you know, throughout business and life, he said, don't worry about the horse being blind, just load the wagon. Yeah. And that to me was all about, don't worry about the obstacles. You're going to find obstacles. There's going to be people who tell you it's not going to work and tell you why it's not going to work. But as long as you continue to find ways to get around those obstacles and go through those obstacles, you can have success. Yeah. And I, I know it's, the, uh, you know, an, another sort of you know, analogy is you know, no one climbs Mount Everest because it's easy. Yeah. You know, we, we, we go we for these golf. things because it's, it's a challenge. You know, that's why golf gets us coming back. If we all went out and you know, we could hole in one every single hole every time we went out, we wouldn't play the game. Right. You know, they, they designed Absolutely. that hole just big enough <laughs> so that we would miss it. <laughs> you know? Oh, listen, if but, it was four times the size, we'd still miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't even, um, I can't so even I hit the green some days. To, I want to get to what we're actually talking about right now in chapter seven rules, mm. right? Yeah. Very strict rules uh, in, in golf, but really there are no rules in business yet. And I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ev every game has rules. You can't play a game unless there are rules, you know, and uh, otherwise it just becomes you know, un unplayable. In business, there are there are a certain amount of rules that are set by the outside world, like tax rules and health and safety rules and employment rules. But those are very, very minor. When we come to run our own business, if we don't set our own rules, then the people playing our game have got no idea what they're doing. So that would be like taking 10 mates to go and play golf and you not telling any of them how to play golf. Right. Yeah, you know, it'll just be chaos by the third hole. You know, they'll all be doing different things, picking the ball up. Oh, I'll just move it. I still play with people that have been playing for 20, 30 years that still don't seem to understand the rules of golf. Uh, <laughs> but, they have uh, their own <laughs> but they have their own set of rules. So they're playing their own set of rules. I'm trying to play by my set of rules or the set of rules. And then we're going to fall out at some stage along the way. And that's one of the big things within within running your own business is it's your game, yeah, as, as the owner or if you're the CEO or the director, it's, it's, you've got to decide what those rules are. And when people abide by them, that's great. And when they don't, you've got to bring them back in line. You know, it's not a case of, right, you, you didn't achieve the rules, so you're sacked. It's, well, if you didn't achieve the rules, why didn't you? Probably because you weren't aware of them. And, and that's the biggest thing within business is, we have these rules in our head, but we don't actually verbalize them out so that everyone can understand and play the game. And you see this, the, the most in a fast growth company, a company that's sort of taken on 10, 20, 30 
people every year, but even more than that, that what starts out a nice business that's working really well turns into a complete toxic environment. And uh, there's a guy, Tony Shea, I don't know if you came across Tony Shea, he uh, sort of was one of the founders of uh, Zappos, the online shoe business in, in the States. Um, and his first business did that. And he basically got to a point where he couldn't get up in the morning, and go to work because he hated the culture and the environment in which everyone else was working. And that's when he decided when he started or didn't start Zappos again, he invested, he saw an idea. He was an entrepreneur and saw how to exploit that idea. Um, he, he wanted to actually build a culture that was actually conducive and everyone understood how to play the game. And one of the great things, their, their office is in Vegas and we use it as part of our training for, for new action coaches around the world. And when you go into their office, if you're wearing a tie, yeah, one of their rules is no one wears a tie. So the uh, you, you you sort of walk in and they sort of say, oh, what's your name? And they lean over, grab your tie and chop it off with a pair of scissors. <laughs> and they put they put them up uh -oh. on the wall. They said, those are our rules. <laughs> you don't wear a tie in our in our building. Okay, well, I'm, wow. I'm, on, I'm on your plan. I can sit there and whinge and moan about it. You've just ruined my fa fabulous £200, $200 silk tie. Um, but those are the rules of the game when you come into Zappos. So. Interesting. That's fascinating. All right, let's take another time out. And then I want to pick your brain more about, um, you know, we talked about rules. Do we go back to Chapter 5 or we move to Chapter 8? And we'll find out right after this. Okay, so we talked about the rules, but now uh, I it it kind of lent to me to go backwards in the book to chapter five, hazards and conditions. Hmm. Um, and you know, we talked about the the obstacles in your way, and you make some beautiful analogies there between again between golf and business um, in chapter five, hazards and conditions. I I love this chapter. I, this was one of my. I think this is almost probably one of the first ideas that I had in analogies that when oh, really? I'm working with a, with a client and they're sort of sitting there whinging and moaning about, you know, taxes or the gov what the government have done, you know, and COVID to be honest was, was one of these, you know, COVID hit the, the whole world and then, you know, people in business just went into panic mode. And they were sort of, oh, I'm blaming, you know, the, the Chinese and I'm blaming the government for closing things down. And I said, look, you know, shit happens. You know, you, these are not in your control. You, you have no control over what's going on. That, and that's like standing, you know, on, the, on that first tee on a windy day, the wind blowing in your face going, it's bloody weather. I can't, you know, I can't play golf in bad weather. It's like, well, the weather is the weather. The bunker is the bunker. The... The water hazard that's there is is there. It's been there since the start, you know, since the course was built. There's no point in moaning about it. What you're really saying is, I'm not good enough to play in these conditions. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to actually own and saying, when COVID hit was actually, I've never been through this situation. I don't know how to play this game now. The game has changed. I don't know how to play this game. So what I did with all my clients was, because that was my fourth recession that, you know, because we thought it was all going to be a recession. I mean, it's amazing how it hasn't happened, but maybe World War Three will be the, the recession <laughs> that would have been. Um, but these things happen and, and you've got to, the more you've experienced it and the more you've been through it, the more you realise that, okay, yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, there's going to be fallout. Yes, we may not survive this. But there's no point in moaning about it. You know, you've got to pivot. You've got to take action. You've got to be in control of it. You have control over that golf ball, what you do with it. Maybe that's the time not to go over the water. Maybe it's the time to play a different club and play safe. Maybe in your business, it's a time just to shut everything down, you know, furlough people and sit and wait. Maybe it's a time to ramp things up. You've always got the ability to do something. Yeah, and if you don't know what to do, then you need to go and talk to somebody about it. Yeah, until you actually find out what you're going to do, because just sitting whinging and moan about it 
ain't going to help anybody. <laughs> but, uh, and there's a, there's a lovely quote there. I think it was from Jim Rome was, you know, never wish your life were easier. Just wish that you were better. And I, I keep having I to say, having to say to that myself <laughs> on that, uh, on that golf hole that I hate and I never play well. It's not about the golf hole. It's just about me. <laughs> I've just got to be yep. better at playing and this hole. History so. has nothing to do with your next shot. We've yep. already established that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to go back to chapter two now Ooh, yep. and the goal. Mm. And this is this has definitely been my my weakest part of everything that I do <laughs> is advanced planning and creating goals for yourself. But I need a lesson, coach. Help me out. It's it's a it's a real tough one um, because. As a, as, a, as a human being, we are goal-seeking missiles. Our, our brains mm. are designed to set goals and seek them out. So in the early days, Stone Age man, you know, had to get up in the morning and go out and collect food and bring it back to feed the family. That was its goal. That was the mission. Okay. So, so level one goal setting is very much about move away from pain. So what's my pain? What do I need to do to move away from it? And we don't have to think too much about that. It's uh, what I would call a reptilian brain function. It's a basic desire of, of the human species is to survive. So we will do whatever it takes to survive. So that's, a, that's very simple. You don't need to sit down and write it out. You don't need to plan it out. It's, it's basically inbuilt to us all. The problem comes is when we're not in pain, then what? Where do we go from there? Now, most people enter a comfort zone and they sit there and go, well, I'm OK, I'm not in pain, so I'll just carry on doing what I've always done and, you know, I'll see where it takes me. The next level of goal setting really is about our limbic system, which is our emotional brain, which is about what makes us feel good. So if there are things in our life that drive us forwards, then that becomes the next goal. So maybe it's, you know, the house that we want to live in. You know, maybe it's the holidays we want to go on. Maybe the cars we want to drive, the boats we want to own, the holidays, you know, the, the restaurants we want to eat into. So a lot of people take to the next level about their wants and desires, which then drives them forwards. Now that, again, takes you so far, but at some point you get everything you could possibly want. Yeah, that you're sitting there with. I've got. I've, I don't really. I don't need another. I had one client. He said, "Do you know what? I've had six Ferraris. I don't really want another one." Hmm. So therefore, what drives you at that stage? What really gets you up in the morning and makes you go, "Yeah, this is what I'm going to do." So the final level, the third level, is is what kicks into our neocortex, our thinking brain. You know, this is what we. You know, we have over and above all other animal on the planet is our ability to to think. So our neocortex is able to project into the future and learn from the past. OK, it's our biggest asset. It's also our biggest weakness as well. But what it does within goal setting is that is actually once we've got everything we possibly want, it's no longer about us. It's about other people. It becomes our purpose. Yeah, our destiny, our legacy. What do I want to be known for when I'm gone? When what am I going to leave behind? And and that then is the final driver, which you know from our, our discussion, Fed, is probably where you are within that. Is you've achieved, you said, you know, I've, I've achieved pretty much what I wanted to achieve, you know, financially, and I'm okay. If I if I wanted to stop work tomorrow, I could stop working tomorrow. And that's a brilliant place to be, because you now you've got the choice. Now you can choose whether you carry on. Yeah. And for you, doing a podcast is not about you anymore. Yeah. It does make you feel good doing it, but actually you're thinking about all those people you can help along the way. And it, and if as soon as it becomes about somebody else, that never stops because how many poor people can you help? You know, you were saying about you know fifty thousand downloads a month. That's fifty thousand people every month that you're helping. What a great place that is. You know, that's yeah, that's why you. I got into coaching because you know there are so many people in business out there that I can help that that's never going to end. So will I ever stop coaching? Probably not, because I enjoy it. 
you know, will I do it to the intensity that I am at the moment? Probably yes, because <laughs> it's hard work, you know, and I, I'm still on that sort of moving towards things I want uh, as well. So I've still got some bills to pay and things like that. So I'm still climbing that ladder. But I know that once I've got there, then I can still do what I do. It's a st still a skill that I can do to go on. And that's what I came back to the, you know, the golf professionals, those guys, you know, the likes of Tiger Woods and the guys that have won Masters, you know, they're now playing the game because they want to play it, not because they have to. And I think that that becomes a big step for a lot of tour players is once you've won that major, once you've put five million in the bank account and that's safe and secure and therefore financially, you know, you don't have to go out and play the next round of golf. I think in here, the mindset changes and your level of golf goes up a level or two levels. And the same is true within business is once you've got your business working without you, yeah, and you've got all the money and you're financially secure, then business really does become fun. And that's why the likes of Richard Branson and Warren Buffett are still playing the game because they're not doing it because they have to earn money because they've got more money than they can actually spend. They're doing it because they love playing the game. And people like Bill Gates is now playing the game at a different level with his purpose. Yes. It's now about curing the world of malaria. Elon Musk is about playing the game of putting a man on Mars. I mean, it's a, some would say it was a crazy idea, but you know, he's, he's looking to enhance the world to the next level because you've got to do something. You know, you, you know, there's only so much golf that you can play, as I like to say. Yeah. I just want to clarify for the podcast audience that when you said in here, you were pointing to your head. In, in my head. <laughs> yes. I Apologies to those uh, looking at each other, listening. but in your head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I always used to tell my children when they were growing up, you know, if you do your homework, I don't care. If you don't do your homework, I don't care. All you're doing is limiting your choices. And if you want to be able to choose what university you want to go to, then you're going to have to work hard to get to that point to make your choices. Yeah. I don't always, you know, I used to say to him, and my, my, my younger son recently quoted this back to me. He said, I, you know, I don't necessarily want a Cadillac. I just want to be able to afford the option. Exactly. You know. And I think, and so I think that, my, that is one of the, the, the true sort of depictions of whether you've actually sort of made it is the fact, have you now got the choices? And, and just having money doesn't always mean you have the choices. Uh, and right. you see a lot of very unhappy, rich people because they've got all this money, they've got all this wealth, but they're sitting there going, well, what are my choices? Where do I go next? And, mm. and that can be quite toxic at that stage. And that's why people mm. turn to drink and alcohol because they, they're blocking out that neocortex that has that need to actually go to the next level. If we're not going for a goal if we're not moving forwards as somebody said you know if you're not growing you're dying so mm -hmm. so, so that's why i say our brains are this goal seeking missile that we need to be giving it a task to actually move forwards you know initially for ourselves because you know we have to survive and we're all a little bit selfish deep down but ultimately for the benefit of others and and generally that starts you know, in families about you want your kids to have a better start in life than you did. But, uh, unfortunately, what that can lead to then is sort of parents spoiling their kids and actually taking away that journey of moving away from pain, moving towards pleasure, moving on to help other people. You're taking them straight to that point where you've everything you possibly want is provided for you. And, and that isn't necessarily a good place to start. No. No, let them make their own mistakes. Yeah. All right, listen, I, I'm having too much fun and I have too many questions to continue to ask you. And so let's just uh, take one more break and we'll come back and, and wrap things up. But we're going to do it after this. Kevin, I'm fascinated to to go into depth with you about Chapter 3, The Players. Mm. You identify different personality types yeah. um, that work both. 
Yeah. Um, let let's let's <laughs> dig into that. I find that fascinating. I, I did. I did. When this I this is about golf, folks. Let me tell you, this is about golf. Well, this is You're this is about golf and and about your game <laughs> and life as well, Fred. This is really uh, this this was one that really I love writing this because uh, I when I started writing, I thought it was a little bit risky uh putting people into boxes because no one likes to be put into a box um and I, when i wrote it i didn't i didn't want to be seen as you know putting people down and because it doesn't matter what box you're in in this you know it's about what you make of it but i think when you do accept which box you're in then i think you can enjoy the game that much more but, uh, so so when i looked at this it was really, and it was part of it was my journey as well in golf as well, because, you know, I was mm. very, all of this was relating, you know, it was written from my perspective. Yeah, you know, I'm sure there'll be people out there that will look at it and go, well, I don't agree with that. And that's fine. This was very much from, from you know, from, from my journey in business and in golf. And, you know, I looked at the, the type of player that I see out on the golf course and the type of player that I see within business. And for me, it came down to these sort of four types of player. You know, the, the first player is the beginner. You know, I've never played this before and I want to get into this game. But it, like we said about the, the business startup, you know, my, my father gave up a really good sort of job to start a business. You know, he's 45 years old, you know, earning, you know, what would have been a sort of a six figure salary in today's world. And he jacked it all in to buy a business off a man in a pub. You know, what a crazy man, what a crazy fool he was to, to actually do that. Uh, and But, you know, I've seen far, you know, I say worse, far more entertaining stories. But at some point you <laughs> yeah, get you get into, you know, you want to get into that game. And at that stage, there's this sort of naivety, there's this sort of hunger to actually, and failure at that stage really doesn't matter. You know, I know I'm going to fail, so I'm going to get things wrong. So I accept that. And and the beginner really is has a thirst, generally has a thirst for knowledge. You know, so if somebody starts, yeah, OK, I'll listen to people and I'll take that on and I'll try that. And you, you can see them on the golf course. You know, people are, you know, do you want some advice? Yeah. OK, well, hold hold the grip, you know, stand a bit different. And you can see it going around their head and. It's, they're really excited about it, but they generally make, end up making more mistakes than perhaps they should do. And perhaps if they just listen to one person and actually had that coach from the start to take them through step by step by step by step, they'd be in a much better place. So once the beginner gets to a certain level, they then become an improver. Okay, so the improver is a conscious decision that says, okay, I'm, I'm good at this. Yeah, I, I've I've mastered the basics, but I want to be better. So then there's a commitment then to actually continue that journey, because a, a lot of people I see, and I, I I'm basic, I'm also buying businesses now, so I'm you know looking for business to actually acquire, and then you know take away from the business owner, and then sort of build up. And I'm seeing a lot of businesses that are probably being run by. 50 60 year olds 20 years in business that are probably under half a million uh in sales so they go well i've been in business 20 years well i think well no you, you've been in business three years and you've just repeated that for the next 17. wow because the business has grown to half a million and then it's just plateaued it's just stayed at a certain level for those 20 years to a point where you now want to get out. So you don't have a business that works without you. So you've basically created yourself a job, yeah, which you've worked in for 20 years and now you're expecting me to buy your business, buy your job, yeah, and frankly it's not worth anything. It's paying the bills. Yeah, we've had we we had a teacher on the show once asked a student how long have you been playing golf? He goes, oh, I've been playing since I was a kid. I've been playing 40 years. Hmm. He goes, well, how often do you play? And he says, eh, three, four times a year. And he goes, so actually you've been playing for six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been turning up to the golf course for, you know, every single day, but I've only played, you know, once a month. And, and that's yeah, exactly. really, you know, that sort of, that decision to go from a beginner to an improver is that conscious decision. 
you know, that I, I want to get better at this. And that's what I did within golf is, you know, I started at sort of, yeah, well, I started, I, I, because I'd, I'd played as a, as a kid, so I had some basics. So I started at 18 handicap. My goal was to get that down. I got down to 15, then down to 12, then it was down to single figures, and now I'm at nine. And my goal now is to get down to six, and it bloody gets harder. <laughs> as you, further down you go, the harder it gets. And that's the same in business, is getting a business up and running to turn over 100,000, 200,000, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's quite simple. You just have to work hard. To take it to half a million is a little bit more complicated because now you've got to start employing people and get those people to work. To get it from a half a million to a million and over is really tough. And mm. I, I did the statistics in the UK that 98% of businesses, UK limited companies, these are actual physical companies, 98% of those businesses that are currently running at the moment are less than a million pound turnover. Employ less than 10 people. 98%. Wow. So so that to me says, have they got have all of those businesses got the ability to be bigger? Yeah, of course they have. You know, they're, they're in sectors where there are bigger players in the market, but the majority of businesses, and I'm, I'm sure that the same is true in the, in the States and around the world, they're, they're businesses because they're started by beginners who then miss out the improver level and go straight to what I call level four, which is the lifestyler. So the business now has been created to provide that person the lifestyle that they wanted when they started the business. And that's generally speaking, I'm being very generalistic here, is an income a little bit more than they would do if they had a job, you know, maybe where they were. My father was was that, so his, his business was grown to a point where it was bringing in a little bit more than where he was. And it gives them the lifestyle, the ability to do in their mind what they want to do. You know, because that's, that's one of the big things with having your own business is the autonomy to make your own decisions. I get to employ the people I want to work with. I get to work the hours I want to work. I get to earn the money I want to earn. The problem with that is when you really think about it, have you really got the team that you really want? Very often not. You've got the people that you know, stay with you <laughs> and don't leave. Um, right. Yeah, Are you really earning the amount of money that you really want? No, you're probably earning the amount you need, not what that goal is because you never set a bigger goal of where you wanted to get to. And, you know, have you really got the autonomy and the free time? No, because you're actually still working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And that was that was one of the main reasons I didn't go into business with my father because, you know, after running it for about five years, I looked at him, you know, when I was coming out of, uh, out of college was, um, well, why would I want to go into business? Because you're earning less money than you did when you had a job. You're working more hours. Mm. You're more stressed. You don't have weekends off. My relationship with my dad really disappeared through my teenage years because he was never at home. Mm. He was always at mm. work. You know, I'd, I'd see him on a Saturday because I went into work to earn some pocket money to clean the factory. Yeah. On Sundays, he was at home, but he had the books open and he was doing all the accounting. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what kind of life is that? I preferred it when you had a job. So I went into accountancy, you know, which is what he did, to actually sort of, you know, to do that. I then realised that, you know, darn, I should have been in business and I should have taken his business and taken it on to the next level. But I didn't have the skills. I had to go out into the big wide world to, to learn those skills Absolutely. before I was ready to do that. So, and yeah, then, so, that, so that's the beginner, the improver, the lifestyler. And then the, the, sort of the, the, up, the third level, fourth level is the master. And this is what I would say is, is the, the true pro, the person that's got to that level where they, they do it because they choose to do it, not because they have to do it, that they've spent a lifetime refining the skills and becoming, you know, as good as they possibly can. But the key thing to the master <clears throat> is the master never thinks they're a master. Other mm. people look at them and go, you're the master of that game. They're going, yeah, but I could be better. That's golf. And that's golf. And that's business as well. 
yeah and the, the true masters in business are not happy because there's always another level or there's always another mountain to climb yeah i'm great at this level but i want to be at this level i'm great at this level but i want to be at this level and that's what i i think really defines a master is is they they have that continual improvement mindset which is the mindset of the improver but they do it not because they have to do it because they want to do it and they just keep on going they know that say if you're not you know if you're not growing then you're dying uh, and that's what i love within sport and certainly within golf is you know you look at those guys they go out they're the best of the best of the best after a round of golf they go on the range and they go and hit another 200 balls gal shoot a 69 uh or you know i'm sorry 65 59 and then in the press conference afterwards, yeah, but I missed that yeah, putt, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, but look what you just, yeah, well, you know, yeah. I'm over with that. Now I got to move <laughs> on to the next one. One of the words that I kept seeing throughout the book that related to both that really stood out to me, simple, but it's the word skills. Right. Yep. I found that. It just, it drew me in. It really did. But I want to wrap it up with this one. Hmm. And it's, it's the, uh, your, your final chapter. Uh, what's the importance of the 19th hole? Both? <laughs> the, I mean, I think the, the 19th hole was really sort of to, uh, to bring it all to, uh, together, um, was, you know, at the end of the day, it is a game, you know, business is, you know, golf is a game and it's, at the end of the round, it's going there with your mates and talking about it and having a laugh and understanding that, okay, you might have had the worst round of your life, but you can still have a drink. It isn't your life. Okay, the, you, know, you are not golf yeah. and you've got to be able to leave that behind. And I, I beat myself up probably as much as, you know, as anybody when I have a bad round. And, I, you know, I, I've had the old tantrum on the golf course and things like that. And I, I find sometimes that a bit hard to, you know, to make that separation. But it is a, a big lesson that we all need to learn that, you know, what you've just done is is history. And I, it really came to me, I think it was a, a Masters a couple of years ago. And I think Rory McIlroy, Ian Porter, and um, I think one other missed the cut. And they had a video of they were all in the bar afterwards having a drink and went yeah okay it was a bad day and i just thought yeah sometimes you just got to leave it behind have a beer and move on with it and and that's really within business as well is there's got to be a time to move on there's got to be a time that the game is over and too many people in business don't have that in mind that you know the business is their life it's them it's who they are and that separation gets blurred over the years uh, and that's mm -hmm. why i always think you you know you start a business with a goal and that goal should be to build it so it's a commercial profitable enterprise that works without you and you have the ability to sell it and at some point you need to sell that business you need to move on now does that mean you give up the game no you can start another business you can do something else but you've got to know when to let go and I, i've seen too many cases where people have hung on to their business too long. And my, my father, unfortunately, was one of those. 15 years of growing his business, <clears throat> hit the recession of the 92, 94, and lost the whole thing. Mm. You know, while you're, while you're at the poker table, you've always got a chance of losing. And, and business, there is still an element of luck involved in a business, as COVID has shown many Enrist. people. And, and there's a risk and therefore you need to know when to walk away. And, and that point is when you can cash in your chips, take a big wad of money and go, right, that's my financial freedom sorted out. Invest that in, in some good assets, get your income, and then you've got a choice. Do I go and play more golf or do I go and start another business? And that's what we come back mm. to is life is just about getting yourself to where you have the choices you want to make. Beautiful. Um, years ago, I, I had somebody on the podcast that had this phenomenal explanation for the 19th hole for me and that really s stayed with me is that, you know, people think that you want to go out and play golf with um, for business. 
you want to go out there and play golf with people that you're going to be doing business huh. with. And the lesson that I learned from that was you don't talk about business until the 19th yeah. hole. What you do on the golf course is you learn if you want to do business with that person because because golf exposes character. Yeah. You can see how they handle themselves in adversity. And then you can ask yourself, do I really want to do business with this person? Yeah. And you learn a lot and then go talk about it in the 19th yeah. hole. Yeah, I think that, that's, that is great. I, I, I am a people watcher in, in golf and uh, <clears throat> games are a reflection of life. And it's very hard to put on an act when you play a game um you know you the the real you comes out and it's good to watch and go okay yeah so are those good traits are they not so good traits do i want to work with somebody that is like that uh, so yeah. very very true so. very true well again kevin stansfield thank you so much for for this lesson today and for your time the the game uh the book again is called the great game how lessons from the great game of golf can help you win the equally great game of business um find kevin on on uh linkedin absolutely LinkedIn. The, the book is on amazon amazon.com so uh, type in the great game and my name kevin stansfield and it'll it'll come up um Excellent. and uh, yeah love love for people to read it leave some reviews as to what they think and uh if you're in business and uh you know you want to be an improver and move forwards then you know find me on linkedin um or on the website and uh, you'd love to be able to sort of you know, help anyone i can i can't help you with the golf that's uh, i'll leave that to the professionals to do that but uh well um, you know as far as you losing your temper, I've got a podcast for you to listen to. <laughs> we talk about we talk about the metal game a lot on this show, and that's why it's called Golf Smarter. Yeah, it's not just the name of the show; it's how we play. How we play, Kevin. Thanks Lovely. so much for joining us. Great to be on, Fred. Many thanks. Bye for now.